and hello to everybody. And uh, before I begin, a big, big thank you to Anna and to Helen and to all those people that have invited me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I've been told that my uh, voice is too soft. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. First slide. It's a quote that I think you'll see the relevance of in a little while. So I'd like to speak here today uh, not so much as a philosopher, but more as an artist whose practice is so powerfully contextualized in philosophy that a difference between the concept, percept, and affect often goes unrecognized as I draw. The relation between artist and philosopher is long-standing, so long that I can't even recall when Deleuze and I first met. Indeed, it feels as if our association has always been there and will always continue a rapport that ba began perhaps even before the physical precedents and consequences of my life, my birth and his death, separately visited us. I hold conversations with Deleuze, long and continuing conversations, wherein syntax and meaning de- and re-territorialize through my work. In these conversations, we address the difference between talk and action, between thought and practice, the osmotic relation between the two and two and 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 over and over again. We engage in repetition where qualitative orders of resemblance and quantitative orders of equivalence provoke cycles and series of works wherein symbols become as sale items, non-returnable in the anal analogous economic differentiation defined by Deleuze between the concepts of exchange and that of theft and gift. As philosopher and artist, Deleuze and I dally then with the cognitive and the emotive, and the marks I make on the surface only iterate and reiterate spatial and emotional depths <coughs> excuse me, through differing levels of perspective. And as I embrace the often strained dialectic between theory and practice, I have to accept that in doing so, I'm destined to live a paradoxical existence. As an artist, I inhabit the small interstices between the tissues and the layers of process and practice, cognition and emotion, physicality and psychology. And as these layers of existence either atrophy in the, into the dust that settles on my fingers as I draw, or solidify into history and memory, they provide the sediment upon which further layers are deposited. Deleuze concerns himself with the elusiveness, the frailness of identity, as do I, for identity is frail, is divergent, is decentered. And my identity as an artist draws on my thoughts that draw on his. In my drawing practice, both in terms of the act itself, as well as the emotional and philosophical context within which it's carried out, the Deleuzean conceptual edifice has provided the framework that both supports and challenges my ability and my integrity as an artist. And in being supported and challenged, I have developed the ability to challenge in turn. So much so that the following quote from A Thousand Plateaus is such an eloquent description of my methodology in general that it bears no paraphrasing. This is how it should be done. Lodge yourself on a stratum. Experiment with the opportunities that it offers. Find an advantageous place on it. Find potential movements of deterritorialization, possible lines of flight. Experience them. Produce flow conjunctions here and there. Try out continuums of intensity, segment by segment, and have a small plot of land, new land, at all times. I am an artist then, but I am also deeply involved in academic research and in teaching other artists. My double or even triple role is to all intents and purposes, however, the same. Academia has been slow to acknowledge and attempt to rectify its overt bias against art practices research but then the tension between academic logic and artistic passion is a strong wrapped up root that reaches as far down through the soil of history as Greek philosophy. Indeed, Plato's conception of visual art appealing only to the emotions rather than to the more sacrosanct reason and rationality led to his condemnation of artists as merely creators of appearances, and he would have them languish outside civilized society, beyond the gates of the polis. Furthermore, such unequivocal relegation of art to the expansive wasteland of perceived ignorance and subjectivity is an idea fostered not only by Plato. Further up the academic root system, although perhaps springing from a different agenda, 
Even John Ruskin, himself an artist, critic, author of Elements of Drawing, suggests that the artist has no justifiable, justifiable place in academia, maintaining that the whole function of the artist in the world is to be a seeing, feeling creature. It's not his business either to think, to judge, to argue, or to know they are for other men. Deleuze, however, argues on the defensive, although admittedly not so much for the artist in person, but rather, and at least, for the creative act. Deleuze maintains that where the act appeals to cognition, it moves towards figuration, representation, but where the act appeals to sensation, towards feeling, it moves figuration through representation towards an essence of the subject and reveals the true figure, the true resemblance. This clearly challenges the idea of the artist as simply a reproducer of appearances. Deleuze understands, then, the artist's trust in passion over cognition. In my own creative process, logic is always superseded by artistic nuance. For example, in my current project, which I will be showing some work in a bit, don't worry, <laughs> science and art maintain an ambivalent yet necessary relation as logical progression is inevitably interrupted by the vagaries of practice and the interrelation between thought, feeling, and action. So, I feel my way when drawing. And since exploring the concept extensively in my PhD, I've come to understand practice as itself a research method. With respect to this, and in crucial relation to the actual drawing act, the act of reflection in terms of both its verbal suffixes, that is through process, reflection with an X, and after the fact, reflection with a T, has become the core of my practice. My work is contextualized in philosophy, although Deleuze tells me that philosophy is not reflection at all. Indeed, with Grattari, he labors the point in their collaborative text, What is Philosophy?, to the extent that such an idea is deemed at best inconsequential, given that it's always possible to reflect without the need for any philosophical framework. Contemplation is acknowledged here as more equivocal in terms of its philosophical character, but ultimately, even it must fail as an adequate analogy because, according to Deleuze and Guattari, where the true being of philosophy is in the generation of concepts, contemplations are actions, things in themselves that may or may not lead to concepts, and as such, are unreliable. A bit like artists, really. As an artist, then, I must find my place in the crowd, that has often obstructed my clear view of the philosopher. A clear view allows me to enter the gates of the polis and challenge as I would be challenged. In the crowd that follows and surrounds Deleuze, each individual must understand him in their own way, but the crowd itself, as a single body, creates a coagulation of understanding which, when explicated, becomes fossilized. I am not the crowd, and neither can I follow, as there are too many, very many, who stand taller and run faster than me. So I take a circuitous route that is guided by the creative act, and there I use the concepts in order to generate them. I practice Deleuze, and hope that such seeming arrogance will be understood for what it truly is. Philosophy, for me, in generating form in the shape of concepts, is itself a practice that is therefore, therefore at least parallel to that of visual art, where the latter creates the illusion of three-dimensional form through the manipulation of shape on a two-dimensional surface. It's important, therefore, that I continue to develop a working relationship with philosophy rather than simply acknowledging its presence from an intellectual distance. And so, where difference exceeds by distant horizons, the limitations of either explication or representation, I engage in complex repetition through the act of drawing, where indifference is internalized, and Deleuze and I, the two of us as singularities, as separate identities, reflect each other. But the reflecting mirror is not all it seems, and there must be more to the relation between Deleuze and I, between theory and practice, than mutual compatibility. It's only when reflection gives rise to resemblance that art rises above practice. If pressed, then, I would describe my relation with Deleuze as one of, the, of conceptual orienteering, and that beyond familiarity and accord, it defines my creative practice. On my journey through his texts, I negotiate the Deleuzean landscape 
even as a conceptual avalanche of significant references threaten to bury me. I keep my balance, although often with difficulty, as I move across planes of pure imminence upon which unrelenting connectivity and the sheer artistry of chaotic randomness prevail. But I stumble over his idea of the catastrophe, the final goal of practice, which he tells me is both my destination and my destiny. Irony here is the root that precipitates my fall. Irony, lying just beneath the surface, is the rhizome that connects me to the Deleuzean catastrophe in its emphasis on the fact that were it not for my practice as an artist, this cataclysmic notion might convince the philosopher in me. Irony, therefore, as befits its character, plays a double role and associates the artist and the philosopher at the same time as it disassociates us. For me, the constant irony of the art process itself rests in the idea that the masterpiece can really only exist at the expense of the master, such that, once lost in practice, allowing oneself to find oneself is impossible to reconcile with the need to create, which is all about the search. My recent book, just to shamelessly plug it, Narrating the Catastrophe, focuses on this crisis of identity at the very core of creative practice. And in amongst the pages, around the edges of this crisis, I've raised my artist's voice in order to raise in turn my objections to, the, to a philosopher's presumed dominion over the understanding of the nuances of visual practice. My point of departure is the point at which philosophy and art become in mutual relation through the medium of practice itself, such that philosophical concepts and art forms are interchangeable and well met on the same plane of becoming. My objections are premised on the practical dilemma that I see as inherent in the catastrophe theory and in the dialogue that ensues in narrating the catastrophe between Deleuze, Ricoeur and myself. We discuss the logic of sensation, a logic that Deleuze, in familiar fashion, himself acknowledges as paradoxically irrational. Beyond logic, then, in my current project, called Osmosis, We Are a Long Way from Eden, I am exploring, the I am exploring beyond the irrational, so far, perhaps, that the irrational begins to become rational once again. So, I'd like to use the rest of this talk to explain. Um, I don't know if you want to put one of the lights out. I don't know if it would work. Is that better, yeah? Uh, to explain as much as I can with words the current project that I'm working on as a way of expressing how my relationship with Deleuze has become so fundamental in terms of my creative practice as an artist. The project has its roots, creative roots, in my enduring, enduring passion for drawing the human form, a passion that has survived through years of precise and cognitively based study of human anatomy. My approach now to the body and to the psyche is exploratory, less concerned with how form is actually constructed than with how it can be deconstructed, how it can be hurt, damaged, transformed, both physically and emotionally. I focus then on the body's inherent fallibilities and weaknesses, and I aim to create images that oscillate between the body's objectification as a harmonious but often fragile structure and its subjectification as a particularity. I interpret the body's humanity through my own physical, emotional and expressive affinity, and I understand my work overall as a complex form of disfiguration, each drawing being a Deleuzean assemblage that pervades the conceptual space between what is considered non-figurative and figuration. Because, as Deleuze says, in assemblages you find states of things, bodies, various combinations of bodies, hodgepodges, but you also find utterances, modes of expression, and whole regimes of signs. So I'm constantly searching for the true resemblance beyond representation. Deleuze's interpretation of Alcord's body without organs, or the figure beyond figuration. And with due respect to Leonardo da Vinci, his quote, a figure is not praiseworthy if it doesn't have the action which expresses the feeling of its spirit, has been scribbled on the wall of every studio I've ever worked in. As an independent research trajectory, the Osmosis Project has its basis in a perpetually evolving overall project that is disfiguration, a profound philosophical and emotional exploration of the human organism, including its psyche. 
This has been an ongoing process since the completion of my doctorate. I'm deeply interested in exploring through my practice how human anatomy, along with the emotion that it embodies, that it embodies sorry, is affected by physical damage and disease. This passion may be obsession together with an equal passion for plants and an understanding of botany has become the catalyst for the development of osmosis. It is fundamentally interdisciplinary and experimental project where philosophy, science and art shake off academic solidity. They become fluid and mutually influential within a self-generating and regenerating process that's perpetuated in creative drawing. Since Hippocrates, medicine has been considered as both art and science, and the Osmosis Project has characterized in an intensive engagement through contemporary drawing practice with both sides of this dichotomy in order to address fundamental issues concerned with pathology and treatment of disease. The primary aim is to provoke and express through drawing alternative ways of thinking about ethnobotanical or human-plant relations with reference to biomedical practices where the latter are concerned with understanding disease pathology in terms of etiology, pathogenesis, morphologic changes, and clinical manifestations. The role of phytochemicals in drug development for particular diseases, phytotherapeutic, clinical, and surgical intervention, the physical and emotional consequences of aging, and genetic modification, will all be addressed through drawing practice within the creative juxtaposition of the physical structure of reality and the conceptual structure of interdependent relationships. In scientific terms, osmosis defines the physical process in which solvent molecules move through a semi-permeable membrane that separates two solutions of differing concentrations. In biological systems, where the solvent is invariably water, osmosis serves to equalize these solute concentrations. Based, therefore, on this explanation, drawing practice is here understood as a fluid process that flows through the membrane that represents our conventional understanding of human-plant biomedical relation in terms of disease pathology. Osmotic pressure, recently defined, I've discovered in botanical terms as water potential, is a term used to define the measure of energy necessary to precipitate osmosis, and as such, it extends the analogy to provide for the structural character of the project as a whole. The drawings become the vehicles for the process and the dissemination of the research through the definition of new equilibriums, which in turn both embody and engender alternative understandings. Where the research is therefore intended to generate drawings through a creative interpretation of scientific intervention, which will engender a deeper consciousness of the ethnobotanic or human-plant relation as it pertains to physiological and emotional health, it is contextualized as a whole within a philosophical approach that is fundamentally based on the elegant conceptual construction of the rhizome, itself, of course, a botanical referent, and its premise of universal interconnectedness. With deference to the rhizome, then, the primary goal is not to provide definitive answers, but rather to adhere to the principles of the rhizome, which prioritize connection and heterogeneity, multiplicity, as signifying rupture, cartography, and decalcomania in order to visually explore the relevant themes in a way that will open up new levels of understanding and lead to further questions. <coughs> For Deleuze, the hysterical character of the art process itself derives from a perpetual temporal dance that's oscillating between a beforehand and an afterward, and which eventually, in instigating its own catastrophe, provides the conditions for the emergence of the true figure through sensation. The figure here being, as I said earlier, the Deleuzean paradigm of Antonin Artaud's infamous body without organs. The body without organs is, by its very nature, at the same time both dependent and yet independent of its own physicality or form. Free, then, of the constraints of surface resemblance, it therefore assumes a more profound resemblance as a virtual body, powerful, non-organic vitality, inclusive of the mind, and as such it transverses the physical, organic, biological body. We meet the body with our organs on the same plane, only once we ourselves are free enough of cognitive restraint to begin to understand the double paradox that it relies upon for its very existence. To understand the body without organs is to create it through such understanding, and further, it is to understand the freedom that understanding the body without organs provides. If we follow the dance, 
we can begin to understand the diverse nature of the body of our organs through an engagement with the randomness and the diversity of an oscillation driven by the kinetic energy of random motion essential in the natural process of osmosis. Thus, being a virtual body and therefore ambivalent in terms of consistent form, the body without organs becomes a fundamental actor in the theater of, of the osmosis project where nature defers to art and drawing practice inhabits the space between ethnobotany and biomedical science and where human-plant relations become mutable and indefined. The transient ephemeral body that is the body without organs here becomes the phenomena that pervades the research process as a whole and its presence underlies the way in which the project presents a clear relation to, if not a progression from, narrating the catastrophe. It is indeed the creative catastrophe, pregnant with rhythm, that gives birth to the body without organs, but it is not the catastrophe itself, nor the question as to whether the artist can survive it, that is the focus of attention this time. The focus here is the catastrophe's progeny. The seed of Edmosis has been a long time in the gestation, but finally the radical is pushed through the protective shield of the tester and into the rhizosphere of practice. This new primary shoot has been growing vigorously as I have developed the initial concept, and indeed there are now offshoots or tangents which spring from the rhizome and sustain the project as a whole whilst ensuring its continued generation. The first of these offshoots coincides with my soon-to-be-launched online residency with uh, C4RD, or the Centre for Recent Drawing, and it's an arts organisation specifically orientated towards drawing as a discipline. Um, and in the words of its director, Martin Hewish, it is London's museum space for drawing. And since 2004, it's built up an international community of artists who use drawing as a core part of their practice. The centre hosts on-site artist residencies, provides an independent, non-commercial public gallery space, has continuous exhibitions, um, but also it maintains a very strong online profile and the online residency program is a core part of that. My work for C4RD will refer directly to the osmosis project as a whole, but it will also constitute an independent body of work. It will document over the next two months of April and May a specific research trajectory through a submission of four separate online galleries. These galleries will present drawings that follow the evolution of a visual study of the pathological development of a specific disease, pulmonary tuberculosis, and its effects on the body and the psyche. With reference to this specific disease, the drawings will address the biomedical human-plant relation and develop phytotherapeutic and relative transmorphological considerations. As a contagious bacterial infection that affects the lungs, and there's a transparent drawing of the lungs and the heart from both sides. You're seeing both back and front. Um, uh, the suffering that is engendered by TB and its further effects led Deleuze himself to his fatal defenestration in 1995. This particular disease would therefore seem an achingly appropriate example of defamation and misrepresentation of healthy anatomy with which to introduce the osmosis project. Deleuze suffered from violent asthma and the first major manifestation of TB occurred in 1968, as I'm sure you are all aware. At the beginning, he tells us through the transcripts of his famous conversations with Claire Poynet, he experienced it as an illness that without pain and being curable seemed hardly an illness at all. Later, however, he describes his sense of how TB causes the body to dissipate, to become transparent, and he defines in graphic detail an embodied experience of a body turning to phlegm and mucus and sputum and finally blood and of air, the need for better air. Susan Sontag points out tubercul how tuberculosis is problematically encumbered by the trappings of the metaphor and is indeed a disease apt to strike the hypersensitive, the talented and or the passionate. She refers here primarily to the 19th century discourse where consumption and white plague became colloquial terms for tuberculosis, reflecting the wasting effect of the disease. TB causes a reduction of silica in the bones and the pale ghost-like complexion.
Deleuze was at pains to describe his view of the illness in general as both an active and reactive force that is not an enemy, not something that gives the feeling of death, but rather something that gives the feeling of life. Illness sharpens a kind of vision of life. However, in the same conversations, he also acknowledged that, considering my actual state, it's a little bit as if I were already gone. This seems to reflect his ambivalence towards his chronic situation, as well as his concept of the body as a perpetually self-differing, self-creating assemblage of processes affecting and being affected by other bodies it encounters. In the Osmosis Project, these other bodies are plants. So, some of the drawings you'll see here, and I'll go through them, will feature in the C4RD residency. And through a self-generating, layering process of visual notations, sketches, and more fully worked examples, they are intended to embody the Deleuzean concepts of disarticulation and stratification, characterizing the potentiality for endless distortion and transformation that is inherent in drawing practice itself, while at the same time referencing these concepts in terms of both actual and conceptual human-plant relations. I'll just go through some of it. These are very, very, it's very early days. Um, so a lot of these drawings are either the body or plants eventually these will transmorph. And the plants are not going to be things that are stuck onto a body in any way. They're going to be things that are actually part of it. The body and the plant dissipate into each other. But as I, I wanted to tell you about this particular project, so forgive me if you're looking at, at sketches, really. In this one, the long, lengthy things that you're seeing there is actually uh, a representation of microbacteria that cause the pulmonary tuberculosis in the first place. And the botanical element that's there is, uh, again, a reference to echinacea, which is a plant that is um, used in uh, phytochemical drug development. There's a close-up of the mycobacteria again. These are drawings mostly done in uh, charcoal and conte and graphite. This is a close-up of the one that you saw earlier of the uh, young lad. The part on the, on the right is a diseased lung. Clearly it's not meant to be his lung or anybody else's lung, the size of it. And it it's, I'm beginning to now sort of merge this into the body as a, as a form where the, rib, the lines of the ribs will break open the lung. And again, that's another. This translucence, I work in draw. I, I do paint, but I like drawing. I specialize in drawing because it's, for me, it's a quicker way. I mean, you can do it with oil painting and glaze on glaze on glaze, which is how I tend to paint. But drawing is a, is a quicker way, and I think a more, well, for me, a more personal way of, of getting that translucent feel, that feel of stratification of layers of work, layers of work, and it's much easier to create erasures in drawings which are marks present in their absence. Again, that's the, uh, that's the echinacea. Again. Very much sketches. Give me another year and I'll bring you there. <laughs> Hopefully over the two months with the galleries, the last gallery online will be uh, drawings that are more fully developed. And because of my commitments to other research projects now, they're going to have to be, again, Echinacea. And that's garlic, which is also used. Right, uh, so moving on. As that was the first offshoot, if you like, drawing TV. A second offshoot that's developing strongly but still is yet in its infancy is concerned with cancer, and specifically gynecological cancers. Here the research focuses on an interpretation of the biomedical and emotional experience of cancer in order to engender, through a creative interpretation of scientific intervention and human experience, a deeper consciousness of the ethnobotanic relation 
as it pertains to physiological and emotional health. A more public aim is to introduce, introduce an artist's perspective into cancer treatment in Wales in order to help raise general awareness of all the four main types of gynaecological cancer beyond the general awareness of cervical cancer that's been increased exponentially since the death of Jane Goody. I don't know if anybody knows the reality TV star who died in 2009. Um, and there's a huge campaign in Wales at the moment <coughs> to, to say, well, hang on, cervical cancer is one, but there are three others. And Anyway, I can talk about that a bit later if anybody wants to discuss further. Drawing cancer calls for the two crucial and interrelated tangents of qualitative research, <coughs> the ancillary roots of the rhizome. The first involves direct interviews and conversations conducted with clinical staff and patients and the relation between scientific intervention and person-centered emotional experience would here, through the transcripts of these conversations, provide the basis for the generation of large-scale drawings. The second aspect is fundamentally related to the first and pertains to the ethnobotanic considerations in terms of human-plant biomedical relations and the relevance of scientific research relating to phytochemical components in drug development and the medicinal usage of plant material in general, and specifically with regard to cancer. Given the relation here between the qualitative and subjective nature of the research and the more objective facts on forms of nature, I like to think that there are resonances of Goethe's aim to overcome subject-object dualism in his thesis on the metamorphosis of plants. In his search for the archetypal plant, the earth plants, if I've pronounced that correctly, or true proteus, Goethe combines detailed sense experience of nature's outward forms with the energizing inner power of the imagination. Unlike conventional empirical research, this is rather a delicate empiricism that makes a subject of its object. The drawings for both the Drawing TV and the Drawing Cancer project will be the progenitors that will eventually generate what I call plantscapes, large-scale and inclusive drawings that will embody as an experimental and visual concern with relations between biomedical science and other areas of thought, including philosophy, literature, mythology, that are all related in terms of ethnobotanical reference. The plantscapes will also address both directly and through allusion a combination of further issues which are embedded in the research as a whole and are no less important for being divergent from the primary theme. These issues include current debate around the relation between search, research and the creative process in general and the ethical and political issues of medical intervention with respect to surgical reconstruction and genetic modification. It's intended that these final drawings, along with a reflective approach to the making, will form the basis of my next book. So... Thank you all very much for listening, and I'll leave you now, if I may, with two final quotes. The first refers very well to the intentions behind my work and places special emphasis on a particularly relevant disease that sadly seems to be endemic in our society and untreated. That disease is plant blindness. Oh. Plants are the most important, least understood, and most taken for granted of all living things. The second I see as a Deleuzean call to arms, or indeed to tangential roots. The wisdom of the plants, even when they have roots, there is always an outside where they form a rhizome with something else. Follow the plants. You start by delimiting a first line consisting of circles of convergence around successive singularities. Then you see whether inside that line new circles of convergence establish themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, not so much as a philosopher, but more as an artist whose practice is so powerfully contextualized in philosophy that a difference between the concept, percept, and affect often goes unrecognized as I draw the relation between artist and philosopher is long-standing, so long that I can't even recall when Deleuze and I first met. Indeed, it feels as if our association has always been there and will always continue. A rapport that ba began, perhaps, even before the physical precedents and consequences of my life, my birth and his death, separately visited us. I hold conversations 
with Deleuze. And hello to everybody. And uh, before I begin, a big, big thank you to Anna and to Helen and to all those people that have invited me here. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. I've been told that my uh, voice is too soft. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. All right. First slide. It's a quote that I think you'll see the relevance of in a little while. So, I'd like to speak here today of change and that of theft and gift. As philosopher and artist, Deleuze and I dally then with the cognitive and the emotive, and the marks I make on the surface only iterate and reiterate spatial and emotional depths <coughs> excuse me, through differing levels of perspective. And, as I embrace the often strained dialectic between theory and practice, I have to accept that in doing so, I'm destined to live a paradoxical existence. As an artist, I inhabit the small interstices between the tissues and the layers of process and practice, cognition and emotion, physicality and psychology. And as these layers of existence either atrophy into the dust that settles on my fingers as I draw, or solidify into history and memory, they provide the sediment upon which further layers are deposited. Deleuze concerns himself with the elusiveness, the frailness of identity, as do I, for identity is frail, is divergent, is decentered, and my identity as an artist draws on my thoughts that draw on his. In my drawing practice, both in terms of the act itself, as well as the emotional and philosophical context within which it's carried out, the Deleuzean conceptual edifice has provided the framework that both supports and challenges my ability and my integrity as an artist. Long and continuing conversations wherein syntax and meaning de- and re-territorialize through my work. In these conversations, we address the difference between talk and action, between thought and practice, the osmotic relation between the two and two, and, 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 over and over again. We engage in repetition, where qualitative orders of resemblance and quantitative orders of equivalence provoke cycles and series of works wherein symbols become as sale items, non-returnable in the anal analogous economic differentiation defined by Deleuze between the concepts of exchange.